The, uh, we are in the book of Matthew today, so if you will open up your Bibles to the book of Matthew. We're in Matthew chapter 5, actually going to get to the end of it today. And uh, in the book of Matthew, we've been studying uh, the Sermon on the Mount, and we started with the Beatitudes, of course, which is what, how Jesus starts the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And he goes on with the other Beatitudes. I count eight. Some people count ten because they add the persecution ones at the end. Um, but the, uh, the Beatitudes are characteristics of the kingdom, and then Jesus continues to elaborate in his sermon about characteristics of what it means for people to belong to the kingdom of God. And that's pretty important. So as we are going through the book of Matthew now, as we're going through the Sermon on the Mount, we're being confronted by Jesus himself. I just want you to remember that the guy who sits right now on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, the one who is ruling the church on his behalf, he's the one that preached this message. Guess what? He had you and me in mind. He knew who would be listening to his message in the future. Now, he may not have known everything about who we were at the point that he preached it because he had purposely limited himself by coming into the world. He did not uh, consider equality with God something to be grasped. He laid aside his divine prerogatives. But once he ascended into heaven, he certainly knew each and every one of us and had in mind. But even when he was preaching it, he knew it was for us, for those who would follow him in the ages to come, as well as for those who were sitting in front of him. So this is not a uh, polite message. This is not a message which is easy. I mean, we heard him say last time, you know, if your right eye offends you because it, it leads you into greed or lust or whatever, he says, you know, pluck it out. And you think, and he wasn't calling for self-mutilation, but he was certainly calling for drastic action. You know, he said, if your right hand offends you, cut it off. Again, calling for drastic action, but it's hyperbole. Let's face it, your hand is not really going to offend you. It's what's coming out of the heart, and that's what needs to be dealt with. But he's saying, Drastic action is important. Well, as we go forward right now, we're certainly going to hear some things that are, again, drastic in nature. They're jarring to us. But Jesus wants us to understand what it means to look like the Father in heaven. That's the whole goal, looking like Father. So that is our theme today, beginning to look like Father. And that is Jesus' goal. Jesus looked like his Father. He said to the disciples, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father because I, I'm the one who exemplify him. So, let's see how close to his, who he is, his characteristics that we look today. We are in Matthew chapter 5, starting with verse 37, going to the end of the chapter. And, uh, well, we'll grow in our ability to understand what the image of God means. Because that's what we're talking about. Restoring the image of God by having a heart like our Father in heaven. Just a reminder, the scriptures which I am projecting today are my translation of the book of Matthew. I've got the credentials to do this. I've taught Greek at the college, university level. Um, and I am uh, excited to be able to do that. But you do need to have your version of the Bible open in front of you because of the fact that I want you to see the different nuances. So, you know, your device or whatever you have it on. When I'm at Morningstar and they're preaching, I got my computer on my lap. I'm typing, looking up scriptures. Uh, on Thursday night, Chris Reed preached on 1 Corinthians 13 and its role in the spiritual gifts. Well, I've, I've taught that about 30, 40, 50 times in different places around the world. So what I did is I took the time to translate 1 Corinthians 13. But listened at the same time to make sure that I was hearing what he was saying. But at the same time, um, was able to dive into the word. And he'd be pointing out something in the scripture, and I'd be looking at that scripture and you know trying to see how I could make it much more accurate in how we do things. So anyway, Jesus said, Matthew 5, 38 to 39, first half of 39, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. 
But I say to you, do not oppose an evil one. That's a little different. Okay, we better get some background on that before we try to unpack it so that we can understand what it is that Jesus was talking about. When he says, you have heard that it was said, he's often referring to uh, a, a, an old Mosaic code, to a law that Moses, God gave through Moses, and the way it was applied, and we'll talk about that when we get to love your neighbor, hate your enemy, because of course you understand there is no scripture that says hate your enemy. But that's what was, a, you know, the popular teaching of the time was that you, it's okay to hate your enemy. You've got to love your neighbor, though. Okay. Here we have a quote from the Old Testament, literally uh, a quote from the Old Testament. It's called the Lex Talionis, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Okay. And it comes to us from the book of Leviticus, among other places. When a man gives an injury to his neighbor, do to him what he has done. Fracture in place of fracture, eye in place of eye, tooth in place of tooth. As he has given injury to the man, so give injury to him. Now, we look at that today and we go, whoa, that sounds rough. Well, it's even more rough if you realize what was going on at the time. This was a plea for just punishment instead of excessive punishment. Human nature is... Uh, Vengeful? <laughs> Genesis 4, 23. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, listen to my voice. Wives of Lamech, hear my words. For I have killed a man for injuring me, a young man for wounding me. He hurt me. I killed him. You understand the natural? Human beings will press way beyond just punishment. So when God released the lex talionis to the Israels, that, that eye for eye, tooth for tooth thing, he was saying, do not require of a person more than they have taken or done to you. Now, by the way, the Jewish people from the very beginning understood that God wasn't saying cut that person's hand off or chip that tooth what they would do very early on is they would get a council of people together who would say, how much would you think is fair compensation if someone knocked your tooth out? How much would be fair compensation if someone crippled you or fractured your arm or did whatever? And they'd figure out in that way so they wouldn't literally break someone's arm because who would that help? But they would say, okay, for that fracture, a jury of his peers has said that's worth X amount of money. If, how much would they think was fair? How much would they need to be compensated if someone broke their arm? And that was, the, that was you know, arm for arm, fracture for fracture, and how they handled it. So it was talking about just punishment, not vengeful payback. However, you know how hard-hearted people can be. So they... As time went on, they kind of forgot the idea of just punishment, and it moved more to, if someone hurts me, I'm going to hurt them just the same way. That's not the spirit of forgiveness and love that God wants his people to have. And so Jesus is dealing with an attitude that is hardened. And they, they'd say, I got biblical support for this. So they harbor this hatred in their heart and use the Bible to justify it. And that's how they justified a lot of things. He said, you have heard that it said an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, do not oppose an evil one. Do not oppose. You know, when we talked about if your right hand offends, you cut it off. And we talk about um, if, if your right eye, there's drastic action needed. That's what he's saying. Because you've got to change your heart. But he wasn't speaking about no self-defense. Um, there's a clear command about uh, not murdering. And if someone wants to murder you, one of the best ways to show your love is to try to stop them from committing this horrendous sin. Because they're going to stand before God with murder on their hands if you simply allow it to happen. So you run, you defend yourself, you do what you can. 
so that this person does not have that awful burden on their conscience. Self-defense, and, and <laughs> we have a duty. The very basic duty of government is to protect its citizens. We all know that. It's to have a military that protects it from outside invaders coming in. You know why government has that authority or that role? Because every household has that role. It, that's because of household, group of households, nation of households. It just gets bigger as you go. But that means that every head of the house has the duty to protect their family. And that means we have to be willing to say, I'm going to stand up for my family. I need to oppose an evil one to protect my family. But it's not my heart. My heart isn't to say, because I want to I wanna get, you know, take as much. This guy's out there doing bad things. I want to make sure the world is rid of this, you know, whatever. That's not the right heart. That's not a heart that God wants us to have. God wants us to have a heart where we are, we're, we're, we're protecting our families, but at the same time, we understand the, the very sorrowful duty we may have to be involved in. He wants drastic action. He wants us to change our attitude right now. But I don't take this to say that you can't protect your family or even that you can't protect yourself. Self-defense is a well-founded biblical right. I mean, it, well, and I could get into it, but I'm not going to do that. So I could, I could, that'd be the rest of the message. Anyway, okay. So don't, don't, he's not speaking about self-defense uh, he's speaking about vengeance and payback. That's why he starts out with the lex talionis. This is the context of the thing. You know, you've heard if someone harms you, harm them back. Well, that means that if you've been harmed by someone, you've got to make sure you aren't bearing hatred and bitterness toward them. That's why in some of the most horrendous cases that we've seen where people, even in the, the uh, shooting at Douglas, some of the parents have said very clearly, I forgive the individual who did the shooting. You understand that is the radical change of heart instead of saying, I need to see him suffer. They've already forgiven. They don't oppose. They, there's nothing more they can do. They, they're just simply saying, I am going to stand with what Jesus said here. Doesn't mean they don't want justice done. You know, there's a, there's a justice that the society certainly needs to be involved in. But, as far as they're concerned, they've forgiven, and now they let the justice system do what needs to be done for the individual. That's, in essence, how we respond in this way, where we're not opposing them, but we're at the same time, if you're in the midst of that shooting, you get out and do everything you can. We had heroes that day who did everything that they could to stop the shooter at the cost of their own lives. So, Okay. So, Jesus goes on in the second half of verse 39. Rather, whoever slaps you on the right cheek also turn to him the other, and the one who desires to bring a judgment against you in order to take your inner garment, give him also your outer garment. So he goes on. He said, hey, here's what goes on. If you are up against an evil person, there's some things that might happen. They might slap you on the right cheek. What's the appropriate response knock him down and beat him with a baseball bat that's what we want but you know slapping someone on the right cheek is not an act of injury in the sense as if they took a baseball bat to you okay that that's it's it's an insult okay slapping someone on the right cheek is a major insult it's not um, it's not going to damage you unless they are so ham-handed, you know? I mean, if I saw someone who was a weightlifter coming up and all of a sudden they were about to whack me with a hand that was this big, I'd be thinking, I might be in danger of my life. <laughs> but Jesus is talking about those who are releasing insults. And in Jewish culture, uh, the right-handed slap, you know, when you go whap, Right, and this way it would have to almost be backhanded to do the right cheek, right? If you're right-handed, otherwise you're doing the left hand slap. He's saying, um, you know, if they've gone after you once, let them go after you again. 
And I mean, can you imagine? That, that's the mindset he's saying. Because you've been slapped, you've been insulted, there's pain there, but it's not the type of pain that's going to be lasting pain. And so, but right away, there's outrage. And Jesus is saying through the power of the Holy Spirit, cut that off. And say, you know, if that made you feel good, the other cheek's available. And that's, that's heavy duty. You know, turn the other cheek. It's not talking about giving up the rights to self-defense. It's talking about the rights to give to, to retaliate for an insult. Now, because there's, you know, in the United States, you retaliate to someone and, and you know, now then it can escalate. Uh, but, you know, at least we want to say something in retaliation, you know. And he's saying just don't, don't. We have a different spirit than the spirit of the world. We don't have to walk in that vengeful Lamech thing where we need sevenfold vengeance. And then he's, you know, he talks about what happens when someone sues you? What happens when someone decides to go after you in court? How do you respond that? They want to come after your inner garment, so also give them your outer garment. Now, Jesus is not telling the Jewish people to run around naked. He's not saying, you know, get rid of it. They'd, they'd still have a loincloth, but that'd be about it. So it wouldn't be like, okay. But the, uh, he's saying, hey, if they are coming after you and that's their goal, you just need to have a difference of mindset. You're not protecting your stuff. God's got your stuff. You just need to make sure that your, your heart isn't so, you know, because we get, when someone tries to take stuff from us, we get really angry and we'll want to retaliate and crush him and he's saying rather than having that mindset you realize god's in control why don't you just relax you know say well you know if they're going to come after me for that i mean get a lawyer <laughs> get a lawyer to defend it but at the same time don't get anxious anxiety filled that's his whole point don't get this let this get you to a place where you're fantasizing about how the person could die in a fiery car wreck See, then you're like John's, James and John. Hey, can we call fire down on that village? And Jesus says, you know, I, well, you don't know what spirit you are right now. By the way, John did a really good job of becoming the apostle of love. By the way, there was uh, this whole thing about the garments was a big deal. If you take the outer garment of a neighbor in pledge, return it to him by the coming of sunset, for his outer garment is the only clothing he has for his skin. What will he sleep in? When he cries to me, I will hear him, for I am gracious. And so the Lord was saying, hey, if you're going after someone's outer garment, because they would give that in pledge, they wouldn't give their inner garment. So you, I, I need you to understand just how they didn't have a lot of clothes. This is like, you know, they may have a house, but if they don't have their outer cloak, they could be cold at night because there just wasn't a lot of fabric material around. And so now when Jesus says, you know, if they're coming after your inner garment, give them even the one that would get you, keep you warm. That, that, to the people standing around him, they would have thought, what? I mean, this is radical stuff. But again, it's a heart change. He's not necessarily prescribing what you actually do if someone's trying to sue you. Um, but he's talking about a heart. And you may choose not to defend yourself if you look at it and say, it's just not worth it. I'm going to entrust myself to God. That's not generally how I would counsel people. But I understand that mindset because it's the mindset Jesus tells us that we need to have. So the do not hold tightly to stuff, especially when it's going to hinder our ability to pray for people, to reach out to them, to love them, cause us to hate people. This is all about what's going on in the heart and our mindset change. Hey, by the way, I told you that Jesus was going to be rough today. Because this is rough. You think about it. Because we all have stuff. You know, we, and people want to sue us for that stuff. It's, it's hard not to get very, very upset about it. But we have the Holy Spirit in us. He can help us be in peace, rise above it. Matthew 5, 41 to 42. Whoever wants to press you into service for one mile, go with him too. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. This is talking about what the Roman military could do in that culture because they were an occupied country. 
So they were. They, this is about responding to inconveniences, to oppression, to the stuff that was going on. If you were a Roman soldier and you were in an occupied country and you had your pack, you could grab any citizen, just like they did um, when Jesus was walking down the Via Della Rosa with the cross. They said, hey, you, you're carrying the cross now. That's because they could do that legally. And they could take you at least a mile. And they could do that with their packs or with other burdens that they had. They could just grab someone and say, you are coming with me for the next mile. They couldn't go longer than a mile. I mean, I'm sure they did. You know, no, no, that wasn't a mile yet. Keep coming. But it was one of the areas. I mean, you understand how angry you get. Just imagine you're going to the grocery store, you're getting, you're coming out with your ice cream, someone meets you at the door and says, hey, just put your groceries down right there. I need you to carry my groceries to my house a mile away. Good luck to your ice cream. Even driving it would be inconvenient. But they carried the stuff. And by the way, the zealots, he lost the zealots when he said, <laughs> <laughs> Any zealots that were in the crowd? This was one of their major issues that Roman soldiers could at any moment tell them, you have to go with me. They'd rather fight. And they'd lose for the most part, unless they had a whole group of them. So Jesus is saying, you need to respond to inconvenience and oppressions with patience and service. It's that service mindset. I mean, it's just that service mindset. There are times people tell you you have to do something, especially your boss, and you get, like, furious because you're like, this isn't even right. But if you do it, and, then, I mean, and it's righteous, a lot of times the Lord will just change your heart. Remember, and this isn't an exact illustration, but we had a professor at seminary who wanted us to memorize Psalm 2 in the Hebrew and then be able to write it out with all of the minute pointing and accents. And this is by the time I'm a senior at seminary in a master's program. This is my third year. There were four years, but one of them was an intern year. I was already done with an intern year. I was about to step out with, a, with the master's degree, and this is busy work. And I was so angry because we were busy. It was, it was a very busy time in our lives, and I was, I was very angry. And as I was sitting down to do it, because you have to do it. I mean, there's no, you know, the professor said do it. You're doing it. doesn't matter how angry you are. And when I did it, my heart completely changed. I was so happy by the end of it that he had required that of us because it gave me joy. It was the word of God, you understand? And even though it was in Hebrew, and I understood it much better then than I do now, um, it was something that was rich and it brought great um, satisfaction by the time I got done. That's a heart change that only God can do. I went from being furious to being joyful. Think about that. And he can do that with all of us in every situation that we find ourselves in. So give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You're thinking... I'm thinking of all the illustrations. This could be your relatives. <laughs> now, the funny thing is, since I run for office, I'm the one that's put the touch on them. <laughs> anyway, um, Jesus is saying, again, this is all about the attitude toward the stuff that we have. He's saying, if you have the ability, because obviously you don't shortchange your family. You know, I've got enough for one meal for my family, but I'll happily give it to you. It's not going to happen because we need to make sure that we, again, are protecting our families. But the idea is, again, holding loosely to our stuff rather than saying absolutely no, never. And, of course, you know, you got your different applications in our culture. You've got, you know, people asking on street corners and stuff. And, you know, I, there's all sorts of reasons. to. Be, I only do that through relationship when people come in. And, boy, we get people mad at us. You know, well, people will sometimes come into our office. This has happened. And they come in and they say, hey, I need you to pay for the... Um, 
my hotel, this is when we lived, when we were at our last location, the La Quinta was right across the street. And so they would come in and um, they would say, hey, I'm at the La Quinta, I can't afford the hotel, I just thought I'd stop by because I know the church has helped. Donna remembers this one. She said, because I, you know, this is our normal response. Do you have a church? Oh, yeah, we do. Okay, good. Give us the number. We'll call the pastor because he knows you. And that way we can find out from the pastor if, you know, you have relationship with that particular spiritual group. And if you do, we'd be happy to front the money, but obviously their congregation is going to bear the, the load of it because they're going to... We don't have a responsibility other than loving them. And if they're in dire straits, we might even help someone. But let's find out what's going on in their congregation and the pastor can, you know, work it out and, you know, whatever. And um, then all of a sudden the people go, well, I don't really, you know, I, I, I don't know the pastor that well. I'm, you know, whatever, because they're making it up. They don't have a, pa- a church home, right? So, and so the, uh, I mean, I know you'd know that people would never want to rip off a church. I came, I had one person sitting in front of me telling about her son in the hospital in Miami and how she was on her way down, just needed money for a tank full of gas because she had to get to her son who was in dire straits. This was back before the HIPAA laws. And I picked up the phone and said, okay, what's the hospital? And the doctor's name? And your son's room number? None of it was true. I said to her, I said, I'm just doing this because you wouldn't believe this, but there are people who would sit right across from my desk like this and they'd look me in the eyes and they'd lie to me. So I got to do this because that's happened too many times. And, of course, it's not all, it was, none of it was true. And so there was no doctor by that name. There was no boy by that name. There was nothing. I mean, nothing. You used to be able to call a hospital and figure out, you know, if you, is so-and-so available? You know, then they'd connect you to the room. And so, uh, but anyway, so Dawn had one where the people came in and she said, church, and they said, well, you know, well, you know, and when that starts happening where they're waffling, where they suddenly don't even want you to know what their church is, you realize this is someone that really doesn't go to that church. They happened to live in that community once in the past, and it was the big church on the hill. And she, she said to them, she says, well, we usually only give funds to people we have relationship with because we know you and we know you're not going to use it for anything negative for your health. Because, you know, again, it's, you would be shocked in our culture that people will come to a church and they will say they're going to use the money for something, but then what they do is they will use it to feed an addiction or whatever. And, boy, did they blow up. This is one Dawn was dealing with sitting behind the front desk and they yelled at her and they walked in the hallway and they were yelling and yelling some more and yelling some more. As they were going down the elevator, they were yelling more. I think they got all the way to the bottom and they were still yelling. <laughs> this one can make people who have a sense of entitlement very angry because they're going to say, Jesus says, give to those who ask. And we go, yeah, Jesus is telling us, have a very, very loose hands toward your funds, but he didn't tell us to codependent people. If you were worthy, we would be willing. But you're not worthy right now. In fact, you're, the fact that you're blowing up, and, and you know, worthy is you, you have a, we know it's going to the right direction. Okay? And, but the fact that you're blowing up shows us exactly everything we need to know right now. You came in here with a sense of entitlement. You thought we owed you. And the truth is, we don't owe you. We owe you a continuing debt of love. That's it. That's what we owe you. And to feed you something that's going to harm you because you're going to use it to get drunk or you're going to use it to have um, you know, your drug addiction fed, that's not love. That's me taking the lazy way out. So I, I need to be able to invest, risk the wrath. Because that's true love. Just to throw money isn't true love. That's to get the inconvenience out of the way. But to engage, to find out, I don't want to harm this person, but you're risking the wrath. And that takes love because that's, that's the self-sacrificial nature of love. So responding to financial requests, we want to have a generous spirit, but at the same time, we want to make sure people are not just harming themselves. Um, and if it becomes obvious that they're not being responsible with their own funds, you know, and they expect you to be their pipeline, you're not helping anybody. If you won't work. I think there's a song like that, that Paul said it. The one who doesn't work, 
you know, should not eat either. There's a, there's a consequence if we're absolutely irresponsible. But there's everyone gets into a tight spot sooner or later, and you have, you know, that's why we have to have that generosity, that generous spirit. Verse 43, 44, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray on behalf of those who persecute you. Here's the one where only half of it was in the scriptures. Uh, <laughs> you have heard means, yeah, this is something that is being talked about, and it's there's a Leviticus 19.18, do not take revenge, do not bear a grudge against the sons of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am Yahweh. Yahweh's God's personal name, usually spelled capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. We call it the Tetragrammaton, but if you were going to pronounce it or write it out, that's the way it looks like. And so uh, there's a whole move, by the way, among evangelicals that are translating the Bibles right, th- right now is to get rid of that affectation, if you will, of just, because this is God's personal name. He gave it to us. And we hide it behind the word capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D as if it was a title. It's not. It's his personal name that he gave in the Old Covenant for us to understand who he was. And, I mean, there's cults out there that use it just because they, and by the way, Satan sets that up so that people don't want to use it. By the way, God does know who you're talking to when you say Lord. So whatever you're comfortable with. So don't don't take revenge, don't bear a grudge, and... uh, Love your neighbor as yourself. That's certainly scriptural. Love your neighbor as yourself because we have a tendency not to love our neighbor as ourself. But what happened, as is usual, the Pharisees especially decided we need to tell people what it means to love your neighbor as yourself. Who's your neighbor? And there's a whole parable about that. Not, you know, Jesus talked about the Good Samaritan and all of that. He's the one that had to break down the teaching that had been going out there that you only love your neighbors. The Samaritans aren't your neighbors, so you don't have to love them. In fact, hating them is fine. You can hate your enemies. And the Samaritans were definitely, that's why when Jesus told that story, that the people there, it was like, blew their minds. What? It was a Samaritan that helped? What in the world? So you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor, and that's certainly scriptural, but hate your enemy? That's not scriptural, but it's what they taught. Hate your enemy. I mean, we have examples of it in the Qumran community. The people would say, you only love the people in the community, the people outside the community you hate. That was a literal teaching. So, you know, that, that happens. I mean, I come out of a denomination. We do this in denominations. And by the way, whenever I mention my denomination, I, I'm drawing on my experience, but I want to let you know I thank God that I grew up in that denomination. That's where I came, that's where I came to learn of Jesus. And it's where I was equipped. It was where they required me if I was going to become a pastor to learn Greek and Hebrew. I wouldn't have learned it otherwise. And so I have a great debt to them and to the training from the time I was little. But there were some things that they're wrong in. And one of the things that they're wrong in is the fact that they say, you only love your neighbor. Now, they wouldn't say that, but they'd say, uh, don't have fellowship with any other Christians. Fellowship means you don't worship with them. You don't pray with them. And that, that, by the way, that's a stage of hate. If I say to a Christian brother or sister, I'm not praying with you because you're not just like me, it means that I love my theology more than I love a relationship with you. And Scripture is very clear that that's a level of hate. And, you know, that's, that's not a good thing. One of the reasons I left the denomination because I couldn't, you know, that was just too much for me. I, I, my goal is unity. My calling is to release peace and unity. Major part of my calling. So you can understand that as I was a part of the denomination, there was this sideways thing that just didn't fit. But there is that aspect. Anytime, when I say to someone, you can't have the Lord's Supper with us, even though you're a Christian, you love the Lord Jesus Christ, um, I am saying something that is unlovely. And that was my denomination. You, you, we couldn't, have communion with anyone outside the denomination? You guys still part of the denomination? Did you have communion this morning? <laughs> okay. Uh. 
They sat in front. She said, though, your poor relatives. I'm sitting there sitting in front. They don't, this is like the place I can pick on people. So. But I never pick on you, do I, Penny? No, I don't. Pick. You pick on me sometimes, but, you know, that. Anyway. Uh, no, do not stand up. So we're, we're you know, we got this thing where you're saying to your, you know, by the way, in, in 1 Corinthians 11, it says that that is a very dangerous thing to do to separate the body of Christ over the Lord's Supper. He actually says to the Corinthians, that's why some of you, are, you're weak, you're sick, and some of you have fallen asleep. Falling asleep doesn't mean they were taking a nap. It means they had died because of this divisive practice. And much of the body of Christ is weak and sick and people die needlessly because of the fact that they have this divisive thing in it where you're literally saying to someone, I know we're all Christians, but we can't celebrate Jesus together. It's very difficult. So, Jesus says, I'm telling you different. You don't hate your enemy. I'm telling you, love your enemies. Now, By the way, the word love there is agape. It'd be nice if he just used the Greek word phileo. You know, have a nice, friendly relationship with him, right? You can wave to him. They're your neighbors. Hey, how you doing? This is is phileo. You walk outside, and there's your neighbor out there taking the garbage out, and you wave, and you say, I hope you're having a good day, and you go back in. Agape is after the garbage trucks go by, you take his garbage truck, you know, stuff back, his uh, containers back up to his house. Don't take them over to your house. You're in trouble if you do that. <laughs> I had a neighbor do that once. She told me, she says, oh, these are mine. I went, <laughs> now, you can get a replacement without too much trouble, but I was like, I don't think so. But there's a difference between that nice, hey, this is a nice camaraderie to actually serve in the other person. That's the point. Love is sacrificial. God so loved the world, agape, that he gave. There's a sacrifice to it. Now, I mean, taking someone's garbage cans from the road up to their house isn't a huge sacrifice, but it is a sacrifice. It's an act of love. It's not just the neighborly friendship thing. Hey, how you doing? There's a step beyond that. There's sacrifice involved. So Jesus is saying, love your enemies uh, sacrificially. And then he's saying, by praying for them is a great way to do it because praying for your enemies... Is hard. It's hard. I could tell some stories here. I won't. But it's hard. And I've been confronted by the Lord saying, put them on your prayer list. You know, I can show you the scars. (laughs) And the Lord says, put them on your prayer list. So, I, you know, you put them on the prayer list and you don't pray like real in-depth for them at first. And it's going to go, Lord, just save them. And then if your heart starts to unfreeze a little bit more, which will inevitably happen if you're praying for them, then you start to get more in-depth with your prayers until you actually get to the point where if something bad was happening to them, you'd feel bad because they're on your prayer list and you're praying for them. So, Okay. And then verses 44 and 45, moving right along because I just looked at the time. I'm having too much fun. All of this so that you might be sons of your Father who is in heaven. Miss the linking verb there. Who is in heaven. For he causes his sun to shine upon the evil people and the good people and the rain to fall upon the righteous and the unrighteous. So you want to look like your Father in heaven? Do the things that he just said because that's how the Father looked. And Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And people want to look at us and see the Father too. At least that's God's plan that they see the Father when they look at us. If you want to be sons of your Father in heaven, that's what you need to do because this is our goal in life. And what does he do? Well, he, you know, he sends sunshine, but he doesn't just block out those who don't like him. He causes the sun to shine generously on his enemies. You say, well, yeah, but that just makes sense. Oh, really? You don't think in the way that he does things, he could have made the sunlight less powerful for those who don't love him? Let's just look at the land of Goshen during the time of the plagues. 
The people in Goshen had light. The people that weren't in Goshen didn't have light. Oh, he's quite capable of making this differentiation, but he doesn't because he is a generous God, and he is a God who wants people to see his goodness. So he causes the sun to shine generously on his enemies, and he causes the rain to fall generously on his enemies. And they need rain for their crops, so he's going to make sure that they have the rain for their crops. He'd have the easiest way to get rid of his enemies. He just turns off the faucets of heaven. Or turns on too much water. We know about the flood. Said he's not going to do that again. But if he turned off the faucets of heaven, that'd be a great way to deal with his enemies because they would just die. They'd starve. That's not his heart. He wants to demonstrate his goodness and his love. And so we want to demonstrate God's goodness and love. We have to start walking in some of the things that Jesus is saying. Not holding on to our stuff so much at the expense of people. Not holding on to our personal dignity and our sense of insult and outrage so much. Or our sense of vengeance. All of that is, he's just stripping it away and saying, this is not how people who want to look like the Father look. By the way, by this time you already know we need his help. That's what I talked about in the communion today. It's, it's, we, need his help. we need the Holy Spirit in us to be shaping our hearts so that this can happen. It's all easy to talk about this stuff when it's like, you know, theoretical. But when it's not theoretical and it's, comes, it's, it's cost us a pound of flesh, this is when it, it becomes real. Verses 46 and 47, For if you love the ones who love you, what reward do you have? Do not tax collectors do this same thing, not to do? And if you greet only your brothers, what is special about what you are doing? Do not the Gentiles do the same? Yeah, he's getting pointed. There's no reward for remaining in your natural circle of love. By the way, it means there is a reward when you step outside of your natural circle of love. God always... We can never outgive God. No matter what we're doing, we can't outgive God. If we're giving financially, if we're giving sacrificially in some way, blessing and honoring people, we're going to reap. Jesus said, if you sow mercy, you're going to get mercy back. That's God's principle is, is when you walk in his principles, you're going to get back a greater harvest of it than what you gave out. And so there's no reward for remaining neutral in your circle of love. Everyone does that. Now, that's just a natural human instinct. We are connected to our own. Uh, I was just uh, reading a particular book while I was driving, not driving, flying. Yeah. <laughs> but the comment, I mean, this is just this last week while I was flying up to, to Charlotte, most people want to be among their own kind. And that's why, because that's where we're most comfortable. It's easy to love our own kind, people that look like us, people that have our culture, people, whatever. The truth is, is the Lord's always challenging us to love the other, okay, to love those who are foreigners, to love those who have different customs than we do, to do whatever, to get beyond our own little thing. He says everyone loves the people that are a part of their circle. But and then he, he talks about the tax collectors. By the way, when they said tax collectors, it was boo and hiss. You know, it's if, like if you say Jezebel from the Old Testament. Boo, hiss, right? You think of Jezebel, mean, nasty figure. Tax collector, same way. And their tax collectors were sellouts to the Roman government in the eyes of the rest of the Jewish people. It's not like our tax collectors today. You may not l prefer that they come visit you, but it's not the same attitude. There's, they were considered traitors to the Jewish people. He said even the tax collectors, the people you hate the most, they do the, oh, that. They love the people around them. And if you only greet your brothers, what's special about what you're doing? Okay. You, only, you walk down, the, by the way, that is South Florida. I moved down here from Wisconsin. You walk by someone on the sidewalk, you greeted everyone. I still do, if I remember. I, 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 you know, just because sometimes you get so focused. But, but I'll try to greet, say hi, good morning, whatever, as I'm walking down the street. And you know what happens when I do that. People look at me like, well, what's your problem? I went into a coffee shop early in my time here in Coral Springs. Brand new coffee shop opened. I wanted to, and they had a particular name, and I was really curious about it. So I walked in, and I uh, ordered a cup of coffee, and I just started to engage the owner behind the counter. No one else was in the shop. And I said, hey, you know, and I just started asking some questions about, you know, how did he get that idea? And he finally looked at me and said, this is what I love about New York. No one invades your business. Wow. He didn't stay open very long. 
I was like, I mean, I'm, I'm just this Wisconsin boy who talked to everybody. And I was thinking, wow. And he, and he didn't stay open that long, honestly, because he, you know, one of the things that, you know, if you're a bartender or a, what do you call it, barista, you have to talk to people. You have to be kind and gentle, and you don't tell them to mind their own business. <laughs> Focusing only on close relationships isn't special. Reaching outside the circle of relationship is. That's what Jesus is saying. He said, guys, you know, don't just be like the tax collectors and all those people that just focus on their own. You know, get outside of your circle. See what's out there. Love people a little bit. And then he sums it all up in verse 48 with the scripture that we all absolutely know about. Therefore, you all be perfect just as your heavenly Father is perfect. That's the standard. Which is why we need both sides of the Lord's Supper. You know, it's kind of nice that we have that communion thing that you can flip around. We need, we need the forgiveness. We definitely need the forgiveness, but we also need the empowering. We need the forgiveness because we we're not there. You know, I don't care how hard you work in this entire life. You're going to be growing to look more like the Father day after day after day after day, but you're never going to get there. I, I know, that'll crush some of you. But there's just so much. And the more, the more God sanctifies you, the more he sets you apart, you start to realize, wow, I'm a lot further away from the Lord than I thought I was. Why? Because he's opening your mind. You're seeing more about your, you know, your unloveliness, your attitudes and things that are just not, a, you, know, you, you rejoice in forgiveness. You don't walk in that. That's why we celebrate our relationship with God. You know, don't walk around with your head hung low saying, oh my goodness, I'm such a miserable sinner. We used to do that as a liturgical thing. I, poor miserable sinner. That's, that's, a, that's a confession of your identity. I am not a poor miserable sinner. I am a redeemed child of God that Jesus Christ has called out of darkness into light and I am walking in his kingdom and power and I can change the world around me in a very positive way. My identity is hidden in Jesus Christ and will be revealed in all of its fullness on the day he appears in glory. I was a poor, miserable sinner. That's just be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. There's a maturity. The word perfect can mean mature, but, you know, it's it, it just, it's be mature as your Father in heaven is perfect. Mature, it doesn't quite hit it because <laughs> his maturity is perfect. So that's Jesus' standard. He's saying, guys, this is the standard of perfection that we need to live on, and he is our Father. Remember, Jesus is the one who was making that radical shift in the people's minds. He's just not a God far away. He's your Father. In, in chapter 6, we're going to hear our Father, the one in heaven. Not the one on earth, the one in heaven. And Jesus was taking our mindset so that we would start to understand that we have a Father, He has a standard, and we can get close to Him in Jesus. So, looking more like our Father is what we got to do. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to, to focus on what it means to look like our Father in heaven. I ask that you'd help us with this. We recognize we need, <laughs> we need a lot of help with this. And we, we recognize that in our nature, this is not stuff that comes naturally to us. It's only something your spirit can work in us so that it comes naturally. So we're asking for that. First of all, forgive us for all the times we've, we've missed it. And we thank you for your cross and your suffering and death for us so that we can have forgiveness. You gave yourself for us. And now we ask that your spirit would empower us so that we'd be able to walk in the way that people will see us and they see the Father's activities through us. They see that we look more like you, Jesus, every day. Please give us that grace and help us step fully into everything that you have for us. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Okay. Hey, streamers, thank you for being with us today. Friday, oh, Thursday night, 7 o'clock. Friday night, 7 o'clock. It's not 7.30. Not 7.30. Those two nights are at 7. We have a big agenda those nights. Normally, we're, you know, we come in on a Friday night, 7.30. We're gone by 9. Um, we need more time than that, for, so we start at 7. So Thursday night, you can stream at 7. Friday night, 7. 
And then Sunday morning, 10 a.m. again, and the ministry team will still be here from Morningstar Ministries. So come on back then. Have a great week.